Hello and welcome to another CPD talk. So today we're going to be going through hemoglobin F in pregnancy, a case review. So much pink, but is it the right kind of pink? So what we're we covering, we're going to go through a basic overview of Clyhowers. We're going to start our case study. Um, then we're going to pause the case study and go through some basic hemoglobinopathies. We're going to start the case study again. Then we're going to go through HPFH, which I will explain later. Um, how we would be able to estimate the FMH in this particular instance. What we can learn from this case study. And then there will be a generalised thanks. So we're going to just jump straight in here with Clyhowers. Now, normally, Clyhowers are obviously attached to the transfusion department. Um, in Medway, it's a bit different, and it's actually part of the haematology department. So this is just going to be a basic overview of what a Clyhower is. It's an acid dilution cytochemical method that was introduced in 1957. It works because fetal haemoglobin, or HBF, is more resistant than adult haemoglobin to both alkali denaturation and acid elution. So when dry blood films are fixed and then immersed in an acid buffer solution, HBA is denatured, which is obviously the haemoglobin that is in adults, um, and eluted, leaving red cell ghosts. So they're like very washed out, um, almost clear, very light gray color. Um, whereas the red cells containing HBF are resistant um, and the haemoglobin is then stained so that they stand out because they're like this glossy pink colour. Now the reason that we perform Clyhowers is normally to estimate a fetal maternal haemorrhage. Regularly we will do this in negative women um, and what we're looking for is whether or not any fetal cells have crossed the placenta um, into the pregnant lady's bloodstream um, and we're checking to see whether or not there's a chance that she will end up being sensitized to those cells. So the purpose of the test is literally just to see whether or not those fetal cells are present in the mum's blood. Now here are some examples of a normal positive Clyhauer and a normal negative Clyhauer. So you can kind of see how the cells are washed out and ghost-like. Um, and then you've got those really bright red, shiny, or bright pink, depending on the microscope you're looking down, shiny fetal cells. It should be noted that sometimes some white blood cells will come up looking a sort of shiny, pinky colour, but you should be able to see the nucleus within, and therefore you'd know it's not a fetal cell. Now, I did just say that normally quite active women um, and it's to estimate how much anti-D she will need if there has been a hemorrhage. However, on occasions, Clyhouse can be performed on positive women. Again, you're still looking to see whether or not a fetal maternal hemorrhage has occurred, but you're not looking at it in terms of having to issue prophylactic anti-D. You're normally looking at it in a case of an interuterine death that has occurred and whether or not there was any trauma that could have caused this. So in the case study that I'm going to go through today, the Clyhauer film was processed on an RH positive lady. Um, and the first person who looked at this Clyhauer got a very, very high bleed count. But she thought the blood film looked a bit funny. So she went and got a second opinion. So we're going to have a look at this blood film now. As you can see, the ghost cells, some of them do look like true ghost cells, but a lot of them look very pink. There's some very, very pink cells. It's all a bit brighter than the previous pictures. Um, I don't know if any of you have seen this before. If you have, then maybe you know why it is. But in case you haven't, we're going to just pause the case study and talk about hemoglobinopathies. So normally, Hemoglobinopathies are something you think about when you're in haematology. They're not something that you bring over to blood transfusion, with the exception of patients like sickle cell disease patients or those with thalassemias who are going to be multiply transfused and it can affect testing. However, 
there are a vast array of different haemoglobin offices that can impact on the transfusion of a patient or on other results. Um, there are actually over 600 that have been identified. So it, it's very easy to get this sort of tunnel vision thinking about sickle cell and thalassemia, when really we just need to be aware of the others. Obviously, there's no way you're going to know about all 600 haemoglobin of these, but just having a generalised knowledge about some of the more common, obviously they're not that common, but you know, the more frequent ones and how they could have an impact. So I've gone through some examples. I have left sickle cell and thalassemia in there. Um, but let's start with variant haemoglobins. There are a multitude of different variant haemoglobins, but obviously you have sickle cell and you can have the disease or the trait. You've then got haemoglobin C and haemoglobin E. Now these could affect transfusion because they produce anemia um, and therefore you could require transfusion support. But obviously it depends on the actual patient and how they are being supported um, and how bad that anemia is. You've then got haemoglobin Bartz, haemoglobin H, um, and then there's a long list of others. As well as that, you've got simple things like increased production of haemoglobin that is seen as being normal. So a prime example of that is fetal haemoglobin. So this can be raised as a result of beta thal. It can be raised sort of HBFH, um, which I'm sure you remember from the title screen. So we'll discuss the meaning of that acronym later. It can also be raised just in general pregnancy, as well as in several other haemoglobinopathies and some haematological disorders such as megaloblastic anemia. Normally though, it doesn't have much impact on the actual patient and their everyday lives. HbA2 can also be raised in beta thal. You can then have abnormal subunits, so diminished production or abnormal associations of alpha or beta chains, aka the thalassemias. Um, and as I said before, there are many more. I don't have time to do a whole presentation on them. I am hoping to try and recruit someone to do one for you. It's not my area of expertise. Um, so hopefully there'll be a CPD talk about it coming your way at some point in the future. So. We're going to go back to the case study. As you can probably tell, haemoglobinopathies are tied in with this case study. So what we did in this case is when we saw the film, we went to haematology and we had a look at the haemoglobinopathy results from the patient's booking bloods. Um, and it was found out that she had maternal haemoglobin F of 8.1%, which is a lot higher than normal normally you're looking at less than one percent realistically sometimes a bit higher so this would indicate that she probably has a mild form of hereditary persistence of fetal haemoglobin you remember the acronym hpfh also known as non-deletional hpfh so what is hpfh in this specific type the distribution of haemoglobin F in the red cells is heterocellular, which basically means the amount of haemoglobin in each cell will vary. This is why some of the cells were almost ghost cells, as you'd expect from the Kleihauer, and others were so densely pink. Technically, though, a pregnant woman is not regarded as having this or being a carrier of this until the haemoglobin F levels are greater than 10%. This is because, as previously mentioned, pregnancy itself can raise these levels. But in reality, milder forms can have HBF levels ranging between 5 and 40%. So the clinicians asked us to estimate the fetal maternal hemorrhage. The Kleinhauer doesn't work um, because we can't tell which cells are fetal which cells are due to the HPFH, um, which cells should be ghost cells. So it's basically a waste of a test. We also can't technically use flow cytometry. This is because flow cytometry uses a fluorescent marker that marks RHD positive cells. Because normally, obviously when you're estimating fetal maternal hemorrhage, you're estimating it to work out how much prophylactic anti-T a pregnant woman requires. 
if the fetus has bled into an Rh negative mother and they are Rh negative, then the mum doesn't need any prophylactic entity. So the easiest marker that we have to estimate the fetal maternal hemorrhage that will require prophylactic anti-D is one that will mark the RHD positive cells. As a result of that, because in this particular circumstance, we are looking at a woman who is RHD positive, we can't use this technique. Now, at the time that we were investigating this case study, it was mentioned that perhaps we could try using an anti-eye fluorescence. However, after a search through some literature, it doesn't seem like that's actually a possibility at the moment. It could be something that occurs later on. Um, it could even be available now because this was from a couple of years ago. But if it is, it's not a routine practice. So there isn't really any definitive way of saying if she's had a fetal maternal hemorrhage or rather how big it is. There is, however, a way to tell if there has been some form of fetal maternal hemorrhage, if you're lucky. You can run the ABO group and phenotype, and if the baby's blood group and phenotype had differed from the mother's, and there had been a significant FMH, then you should get a mixed field result as you are detecting the ABO of the baby and the ABO of the mum. So we did attempt that, but in this case there was no mixed field reaction. So the only thing that we could say was that um, we were unable to perform the test. There isn't currently an indication of FMH, but we wouldn't be able to be sure because there's no test available, unfortunately, in this patient's circumstances to prove whether or not it's happened. So what can we learn from this? Firstly, it's important to be aware of the limitations of testing. Clyde Howers, for example, are not suitable for HPFH patients. I hadn't heard of HPFH before this case study, so I wouldn't have even thought about if the mum had a higher fetal haemoglobin, how that would affect the Clyde Howers results. But now that I know that, I know if I was to see a Clyde Howers result that looked a bit weird, I would get a second opinion before calling it a huge bleed. Clyde cytometry cannot be used for positive patients. That also might be an interesting thing to bear in mind. If you've done a Clyhauer and you've got a really high bleed and you send it away for estimation by flow cytometry, if they come back and say that there was like no bleed, that's not necessarily because you've counted wrong. It could actually be because the baby is RHD negative. So it's interesting to note that. The next thing is, if you're unsure, check with someone else, investigate. They ensured that further investigation was done into that uterine death. The other thing to bear in mind is, obviously, a RHD negative patient can still have HPFH. So this could still happen if you are estimating fetal maternal hemorrhage to give someone prophylactic anti-D. Therefore, if it hadn't been investigated in that circumstance, you could have unnecessarily exposed the patient to prophylactic anti-D when they didn't need it. The final thing is that all sorts of hemoglobinopathies exist and they can affect our testing in ways that you might not initially come up with. So it's always good to broaden your knowledge and apply things from different disciplines. So I'd like to thank you all for listening. I'd also like to thank the senior team at the Norfolk and Norwich Hospital who actually found this case study when I worked there. I just thought it was really interesting and I wanted to make sure that everyone got the chance of seeing something like this because it's something that's quite rare. If you have any further questions about this, please feel free to contact me um, and obviously complete your reflections and you'll get your sticker. Uh, thank you very much for watching and I will see you in the next one.